All right. So uh, I've already warned uh, the good people at Matosin that this might go a little bit late. I hope that you'll all stick with me. Uh, for the last year or so, I've been writing a book. And the goal of this book was to be the best second book that you could read about closure, where you already know what you can do with the language, but you don't know why you would use one part of the language versus another to solve a particular problem. And this was trying to address a recurring issue I had noticed where when I was trying to mentor someone who was new to Clojure, they would get very caught up in the question of whether or not they were doing something the right way, sometimes to the exclusion of getting anything done at all. And so I thought providing a bit of a framework, providing some sane defaults, would help them sort of get out of their own way. And so the first chapter that I wrote was about names. And for all that we pay a lot of lip service to names being one of the two hard problems in software, uh, we don't really spend a lot of time confronting them head on. I think in my four-year program, we spent a bit of a class one day talking about names, right? And the, the effect of this is that when we're debating how good a name is, it ends up being this sort of argument from authority, right? I've been programming for X number of years, and I know a good name when I see one. And this is not a good framework for having these sorts of conversations, not least because if both people have had the same number of years of experience, uh, that doesn't really lead to any sort of conclusion, right? So I had to look elsewhere, uh, but luckily the analytic school of philosophy has been talking about names in excruciating detail for a little over a century. So I was able to just kind of pick and choose the pieces that were relevant to the sorts of names that we create in software and sort of present them in a closure-oriented context. And so I wrote this chapter and I uh, put it out there on an early access site, and uh, people on the whole seemed to like it. So I sort of moved on from there, and things were going well until I tried to do the same for abstractions, right? What makes an abstraction good? What makes it bad? If it's bad, how do we make it better? And this is also a word that we sort of throw around a lot without actually bothering to define it, but worse yet, I couldn't find some other feel that I could just sort of steal all the answers from. Right? There were a lot of uh, books that kind of addressed pieces of it, but I wasn't able to find something that gave a really comprehensive overview that was applicable to software. And so what I did is I read a book that seemed sort of relevant, and I found the bits that seemed interesting, and I looked at its references, and I read those books. And uh, after about six months of not making any progress uh, on writing the book itself, um, I decided that this was really bothering me, right? I am a programmer who's been working for a number of years. I do think I know a good abstraction when I see one. And the fact that I couldn't explain what drove my intuition, right? What made me believe that one approach was better than another was just driving me a little bit crazy. So this has been what has the sort of primary focus of 2017 for me. And so I'm going to share with you sort of what I've read along the way and the sort of conclusions that I've drawn. The first sort of thing that I want to assert is that we use the word abstraction to mean two fairly distinct concepts. And I think that this is uh, demonstrated by two ideas that are very much at the heart of Lisp, which are church numerals and con cells. Church numerals comes from Alonzo Church's lambda calculus and was a way of representing numbers using functions. Uh, the number three is represented as a function, which takes another function and applies it three times to some value. And so we can start from some sort of base case and use a combinator to build up from there, from one to two to three. And using this, we can create sort of a simple arithmetic. Um, church, uh, sorry, rather, con cells are uh, used typically to create linked lists, right? We start from a base case of nil, which is an empty collection. And we can take a cell and we can populate it with a value and point it to uh, the nil and create a collection of one, and then we can prepend another cell onto that and thereby sort of grow out our collection. And so these have a very strong structural similarity, right? They are similar in that respect, but they differ in terms of how we judge them and how that judgment has changed over time. The church numeral has been uh, sort of a uh, constant, right? It's been this sort of helpful way of constructing proofs. It was useful for this purpose in the 1920s when it was introduced. It's useful today. It'll likely be useful in 100 years, right? The landscape of mathematics doesn't change that quickly. Um, however, it is a deeply impractical way to represent numbers, right? We would never dream of using this to represent uh, a number on a computer. Uh, the console, on the other hand, is actually very practical, right? It's something that was sort of the foundation of lists for uh, several decades but it has sort of fallen into disfavor because the 
environment around it has changed, right? The hardware has changed, the problems we're trying to solve have changed. And notably, the cost of following each of these links has grown because computers have gotten faster at a greater rate than the memory latency has decreased. And so, in Clojure, we don't really use consoles for much of anything, right? We much prefer these sort of 32 wide blocks because that fits the underlying hardware much more closely. So the difference between these things is not what they are, but how we judge them. One of them is timeless, right? It is judged against a standard which does not change. But the other one is judged against a very rapidly changing sort of standard. And so when we look at the one definition of abstraction that is constantly referred to in the computer science literature, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. So the paper is called The Proof of Correctness of Data Representations. It's by Tony Hoare who also brought us Communicating Sequential Processes, which is the basis of core async. And this paper introduces two major terms, two concepts. Uh, abstraction is the mapping of a concrete implementation onto some sort of abstract external interface, right? So if we have a set of integers, we might have three methods, add, remove, and contains. And uh, these can be implemented in a number of ways, right? We can have a list of integers. We can have a list of integers which is deduplicated. We can have a sorted list of integers. We can have a tree. We can have a hash set. Each of these, from the external perspective of someone using the data structure, are identical. They map onto the same point. And this mapping is what Hoare calls the abstraction function. He also talks about invariants. Invariants are ways we limit the internal model, right? So if we have a sorted list, uh, to implement our integer set, we need to make sure that if we add something, the list is still sorted. If we remove it, the list is still sorted, right? This is the invariant that each of them has to enforce. And what Hoare points out, the sort of core insight of this paper, is that as long as add adds an element and maintains the invariant, as long as remove removes the element, the element and uh, maintains the invariant, we don't have to worry about their correctness with respect to each other, right? They only interact via this invariant. And this is useful. This is an interesting insight, uh, which uh, sort of allows us to create larger and more complex interfaces without having to worry about some sort of permutation explosion when constructing a proof. But again, this is focused very much on the sort of mathematical quality, right? What it doesn't ask is, how are we using this set? Is it a useful set, right? And what it really doesn't actually talk about at all is the environment, the context of usage. And this environment is important, right? Consider the fact that uh, in the early 18th century, the British government offered the equivalent of about three million US dollars to anyone who could create a clock that could keep accurate time on a ship, right? And this wasn't because they couldn't build clocks that kept accurate time, right? They had clocks on their mantelpiece, they kept time. But if you put it on a ship, all of a sudden, things start to go awry, right? The ship rocks back and forth, the temperature and barometric pressure vary wildly, and gravity is half a, pen, half a percent stronger at the pole than it is at the equator. And so all these things sort of conspire to make this clock that told perfectly good time in this one environment unable to do so in another. And so these three clocks here represent the life's work of one man, John Harrison, who spent 40 years building these three prototypes before he could claim the prize. And so the issue here is not whether or not the clocks were well made, right? The issue was that they worked in a particular context. They assumed certain things that they could not control about the context in which they would be used. And so when we talk about abstractions, we cannot just talk about the invariants, the things that we can sort of control about our implementation. We have to talk about the assumptions we make about our environment. And so when we define an abstraction, specifically a software abstraction, we have to have three parts. We have to have the model, which is the thing that we implement. We have to have the interface, which is a means of interacting with that model. And we need to have the environment, which is everything else, right? It's the physical world, it's the users, it's the other pieces of software. And because the model is sort of empty when it's created, right? And because all the data in the model comes from the environment, the model reflects its environment. And uh, when we think about models that sort of reflect the real world, our mind generally turns to physics, right? Because that is sort of the stated goal of physics. Physics creates a model which describes and predicts what will happen in the world. And I think that this analogy resonates for us, in part because we're very mathy people, but also because 
uh, in software, we're having kind of a hard time of it, right? We make mistakes very often, and this seems a little bit uh, kind of disappointing. But some people look at the history of physics, and they say, well, you know, back in ancient Greek times, they were having a hard time too, right? 60 years after the creation of physics. And there have been these moments in the history of science where we've had this sudden shift in how we perceive things, right? This sort of transition from the Ptolemaic solar system to the Copernican, from Aristotelian mechanics to Newtonian mechanics, from the sort of hodgepodge of laws about electricity and magnetism to Maxwell's equations. Each of these took something that was sort of convoluted and hard to reason about and made it suddenly clear. And we want that, right? We want things to suddenly be clear when we're building software. But I, I don't know that this is actually a reasonable expectation, and the reason is that physics approaches its problem in a very particular way. It tries to reason deductively about the world, and deductive reasoning is, in effect, taking an observation about the world and mapping it into our model, and then manipulating our model in a way that allows us to predict what will happen in the world, right? We need to have a very rich model to be able to accomplish this. And of course, physics doesn't quite succeed at this, right? Newton's theory of gravity could not predict the orbit of Mercury. Uh, Einstein's gravity could do Mercury, but can't do black holes, right? It's a sort of thing that we're asymptotically approaching, but that it's very much the stated goal of physics. And it's telling that a lot of the people who were involved in software in the 50s and 60s, before there was a formal thing called computer science, were trained as physicists. And this is shown nowhere so much as the first attempt in 1959 at a general purpose AI called the general problem solver, which used something called means ends analysis, where it said, I'm going to observe the world, I'm going to map my observation into the model, I'm going to look at where we are and where we want to be, and then I'm going to try to find a path between the two. What actions can I take that get me where I want to go? And so consider all the things we have to get right for this to be true, right? We have to first be able to observe the world in very high fidelity. We then have to be able to predict the effect of each of our actions with perfect fidelity, such that if we compose all of them together, we end up exactly where we want to go. As you might imagine, at the time, in 1959, this was a failure. But this idea wasn't clearly flawed. It was maybe a possibility that just the hardware wasn't quite up to the task. And so this drove all AI research for the next 30 years, up until the AI winter sort of wiped out all the funding. And uh, at the time, another thing was happening, which was software as a sort of commercial endeavor was starting to take off. And so, for both of these reasons, a new sort of approach started to become ascendant, which is inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is trying to reason by analogy. If in one hand I have a phone, and the other hand I have a rock, and my model only takes into account the sort of size and weight of each of them, if I drop the rock and it falls to the ground, I can reasonably assume the same will happen to my phone, right? And what this doesn't have is any attempt to describe a mechanism. I'm not saying, why does it drop, or how will it drop? I just say, this dropped, so the other one probably will too. And for this reason, our model can be much simpler, and a really great example of this is the tick. Ticks only sense two things, heat and butyric acid, which is in sweat. And any time it senses heat and sweat in sufficient quantities, it jumps and tries to latch onto something. Now, obviously, this will not give it a... Uh, predictable outcome, right? There are many different situations where, which are equally sort of hot and sweaty that will result in very different outcomes. And so the point is not that the tick is able to latch on every time. The point is that the tick is able to latch on often enough. And when it fails, it's able to try again. We say that the tick satisfies in terms of its model, right? And this is a term that comes from the vocabulary of design theory, specifically this book here, The Sciences of the Artificial. And the author, uh, Herbert Simon, was a very smart guy who oddly was also one of the principal investigators in the general problem solver. And so in this book, which is very worthwhile to read, there are these sorts of dual threads. There is this sort of thread of pragmatism that led him to coin a word like satisfice, but also this very strong, almost sort of theological belief that if we just apply enough logic, we'll finally win. And that hasn't really turned out to be true, right? And so when you read this, you have to sort of disentangle these two uh, parts. And really, this is true of a lot of the literature from the 50s and 60s. And I want to be clear that when I talk about making deductive models, I don't mean that it's hard. It's actually very easy. If you reduce everything down to arithmetic or first-order logic, it's deductive, right? But, you know, there's a famous saying by Brooks from The Mythical Man Month that nine women can't make a baby in one month. This is a refutation of a model which is simple, 
and deductive and extremely wrong, right? And so the fact that we're able to reduce something down to something that allows us to make a prediction doesn't mean that our prediction is good or you know, useful. And so when we're creating a model, the goal is not to create something which is irrefutable, right? which is perfect. We're trying to make something which is good enough, often enough. And the really key insight here is that when we look at the tick, the tick is able to navigate a complex environment not because it has a complex model, but because it is continually observing and reacting to its environment. Right? It is not trying to plan out all of its actions 10 steps in advance. And for this reason, the simple model in a complex environment can exhibit complex behavior. So again, returning to our definition, which is the model and interface and environment. Our invariant and invariant is a way of constraining what our model can represent. So let's say that we have a field in our app which uh, asks for an email, right? And this gets sent over the wire, and our email is just a string. So it could be anything. It could be an empty string. It could be a bunch of you know, random characters. It could be the entire works of Shakespeare. And obviously, this is not useful. We want this to be uh, something that at least resembles an email. So we apply a regular expression, right, which shrinks this sort of larger number of infinite values to a smaller number of infinite values, but it's still not what we actually want. What we want is a valid means of communicating with the user. So we have to do one better. We have to go and send a confirmation message and have the user actually click on this to confirm that, yes, in fact, this is my email. And we've created this sort of mapping now, this one-to-one -one re uh, relationship between the string that is in our model and this sort of truth that is in the outside world. And this is great, except that the world keeps on moving, right? They might stop using the email address. They might lose their password. The server might crash. They might get hacked. And in each of these cases, no one is going to tell us that this happened, right? We cannot compel the environment to let us know when something changes. And so again, we cannot have this sort of perfect internal model of the world. We can only have something that satisfies us. And so everything that we omit from a model represents a sort of assumption, right? And most of these uh, things that we assume are OK. So again, we have our clock. Our clock assumes that it's on sort of a flat surface. Our clock also doesn't account for the orbit of Jupiter's moons, right? because that doesn't affect its ability to tell time. It ignores most things in the world, because most things are relevant to it telling time. But the fact that it's on a flat surface is quite relevant. right? We can imagine a case in which this is false. We might put it on a crooked shelf. We might drop it. We might you know, have the bad sort of judgment to put it on a ship. And so in this case, what we can do is we can either make sure that we don't ever put it on a sort of flat surface, or we can wrap it in an abstraction which has a complementary invariant. On the one hand, we have a clock, which assumes the entire world is flat. On the other hand, we might have a gyroscopic platform that always provides a flat surface. If we put the clock on the gyroscopic platform, everything's happy, right? We have a clock that is able to be sort of naive and simple, and we have this other thing which is sort of providing the proper environment for it. But this isn't always possible, right? Or if it is possible, it's not desirable. Consider that the C family of languages assumes that everyone is able to free memory once they've been done, once they're finished using it, right? And this is not proved to be an accurate assumption about programmers. And we have an abstraction we can wrap around the language. It's called garbage collection, right? This, uh, this enforces this invariant for us. But this also adds sort of performance overhead and runtime sort of complexity. And so in C++, they've decided that this is not how they want to approach the problem. What they do instead is they have what they call the RAII, or Resource Allocation is Initialization uh, Convention. And so what uh, this does is not quite the same as what the abstraction does. right? This is, we are not infallible. This does not guarantee that we will never cause a memory leak. It just makes it less likely. But this is useful. right? It's not always something that we have time to do. We cannot always go and sort of uh, enforce the assumptions that an abstraction sort of forces upon us. And so this is something that allows us to use something which is flawed. And all abstractions are. And so we should rely on this where we have to, because this is the glue that holds together all these different sort of incompatible parts of our system. But we shouldn't rely on it too heavily, right? Where possible, we should actually try to enforce this. The last part of this definition are interfaces, right? Interfaces reflect the intersection of all uh, the things that a model are and may become, right? Because while we can change a model without actually affecting our outside environment, without breaking anything else in the system, 
the interface changing does have this sort of ripple effect. And so we have to be very cautious about what we change. We have to think more carefully, and so we have to plan ahead when we're building our interfaces. So having provided this definition, right, having provided these sorts of concepts, um, I think it's useful to kind of consider that if we do accept that this is, in fact, a valid definition of an abstraction, what are the consequences, right? What, what sort of naturally falls out of these terms as we've defined them? Uh, the first is that the act of abstracting is the act of ignoring, right? We are only paying attention to certain parts of the environment. And I don't think that this is a particularly deep insight given how I've defined this, but consider again that we tend to um, sort of assume that when we talk about abstractions, we're talking about mathematical abstractions, right? And mathematical abstractions can be lossless, right? There's nothing that they're ignoring because there's nothing to ignore. We don't even acknowledge the existence of a context. And when we fall into this trap, we think that sort of the abstracting is this sort of uh, perfect ascension towards leverage as opposed to a very uh, risky trade-off that we're making. And so when we make a model, the only real question is, what are we going to pay attention to? What is worth paying attention to? And there are many possible answers to this, but the only impossible answer is everything, right? And there's a very sort of clever story by the writer Jorge Luis Borges uh, called Funes the Memorias, which describes a man who can forget nothing. And he's this uh, man, Funes, has some real issues, right? Because he sees a dog, and again, sees the same dog from a different angle, and he can't recognize them as the same dog. All he can see are all the differences between them. And Borges writes, to think is to forget a difference, to generalize, to abstract. In the overly replete world of Funes, there is nothing but details, almost contiguous details. And so, I don't think that any of you are going to run out and try to represent the entire world in your software, but it's useful to remember that this is something that we are doing very consciously. We are ignoring parts of the world because that gives us the ability to reason about it. And so I said that models reflect their environment, right? Because models are populated by their environment. But the things that the model reflects reflect our understanding, our beliefs about what's important. And so we can, if we sort of choose, distort the world into something which is barely recognizable. And so when we judge an abstraction, when we say, is this abstraction useful? The way that we judge it is to say, are its assumptions sound, given the context that we're using it in and the context that we expect to be using it in in the future? And this is actually the fundamental question that underlies most of the debates we have when we say, is this a good piece of software? Is this a useful piece of software, right? We're not arguing about the software. We're arguing about the software's context, right? Almost every single conversation about the merits of a piece of software would be made more productive if upfront everyone defined what they believe the context to be and what they expect it to become. If we say that a piece of software is over-engineered, what we mean is it makes too few assumptions, right? It could have had the same effect with less effort. And of course, that is not really a, a property of the software. That is a property of how we expect that software to be used. And so we should really sort of be mindful of this, especially if you know, we feel tempted to wade into some sort of argument about some new you know, open source framework on the internet. So to know an abstraction assumptions, we have to know its model. We have to know, at least in part, how it works under the covers, because the assumptions in the model are duals of each other, right? What one omits, the other defines. And this means that when someone comes to us and says, you know, you know, this existing piece of software that we use, we all know that it's bad. We all know what its flaws are. I think we should use this new thing. Look at its README. It does so much, right? We can't compare these two things because we're not comparing like to like. What we're comparing is all of the flaws we understand through the innards of the software with what we understand from the exterior of the new piece of software. And I think that this is something that we struggle with because we focus so readily on what we possess, right? The exterior of what we possess. So in Arthurian legend, you know, Arthur is able to pull the sword from the stone because he is kingly, right? He has the right bloodline, he is wise, he is brave, he's all the things that a king needs to be, but no one can see that. What they see is that he's holding a sword, right? So in a very real way, that sword confers those kingly qualities onto him. That is an inversion that our mind does without us even noticing it. And there's actually an entire book that explores this by Jean Baudrillard called Simulacra and Simulation, 
And it's a very interesting book, but I think a more immediate example of this is our current and ongoing fascination with machine learning techniques, uh, specifically deep neural networks. This is an image from a paper called Deep Neural Networks Are Easily Fooled, where they generated a bunch of sort of random geometric shapes that uh, a you know, well-trained sort of network identified as an object with 99% confidence or higher. And if we zoom in on some of these, we can see that this is very clearly not a comic book, right? This is very clearly not a digital clock. But the title of this paper is a little bit curious, right? The fact that we're saying that the neural network is easily fooled implies that we assume that the neural network is flawed in the ways that we are flawed, right? Of course, this is an, an unknowable, opaque model to us. It's just a bunch of sort of weights. We cannot know what sort of assumptions this neural network is making, but we look at it, and we look at it doing a thing that is sort of human, and so we assume that it is fallible in the way that humans are fallible, right? And so it's so easy for us to project what we would do onto a thing without actually understanding at all how it works under the covers. And so this is just something that we need to be sort of continuously mindful of. If we have a model and we've determined that it ignores too much, right, it makes an unsound assumption, we have three options. We can make the model larger, right? We can represent the thing that we ignored. Uh, we can replace our model with something else entirely. Or we can just simply say that this was never a thing that we meant to solve in the first place. In uh, sort of the Bay Area startup, this is called firing your customer, where someone comes to you and says, I really needed to do X, and we say, that's too bad. And that's uh, not an altogether invalid thing to do, right? We can't anticipate all the ways that someone wants to use it. They might come to us with some sort of intended use case that's completely out of the blue and not something that we really want to think about. But all of these have sort of their drawbacks, right? Uh, making the model larger strains against our ability to hold it in our head. Borges, again, has a story about uh, map makers that create a one-to-one -one scale map and just sort of drape it over a kingdom. And he writes, the following generations who are not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been saw that the vast map was useless and goes on to describe it sort of decaying and disappearing. And of course, we don't need to create an infinitely sized model for to be too large for us to understand, right? It doesn't take much. We are actually pretty limited. And so if it starts to get too large, we need to think about sort of throwing it away and trying to find a new perspective, something that allows it to be a smaller model. But of course, starting over is expensive, right? This is demonstrated by the fact that when we have some sort of new little script to write, we don't go and start by reinventing the silicon and then making our own operating system, then making our own programming language, and then finally writing the script, right? We might occasionally uh, make some sort of like little ASIC, some sort of very hard-coded solution to a small and fixed problem. But this is like once in a million, right? We, we deal with the weird legacy stuff that doesn't help us because it's far easier than the alternative. Lastly, if we refuse to solve a user's problem, they have three choices. They can discard our abstraction and look at something else. They can wrap our abstraction in something that satisfies our unrealistic expectations, or they can create conventions that allow them to conform to our unrealistic expectations. And these are all, again, valid, but we should remember that if, for some reason, they're unable to discard the abstraction, our abstraction becomes coercive. It forces them to conform to these sorts of assumptions that we've made. And this book, Seeing Like a State, describes dozens of examples of these, where a government, which is a really you know, regular sort of source of non-optional abstractions, makes some sort of unrealistic ex expectation, and people are forced to shape their lives around it. In Napoleonic France, in rural villages, there was a very nuanced and sort of flexible form of ownership, where people would reapportion who owned which parts of land uh, based on people's need as it changed from year to year. And this was a very robust and effective form of ownership, but it was very difficult to tax. And so when Napoleon came into power, he sent out the tax collectors who brought some surveyors with them, and they drew up maps. And the tax collector said, this is what you own. We'll be back in a year to tax you on it. And the effect of this was dramatic, because now the act of sharing some other part of your land was sort of doubly expensive. And so people began to live their lives according to the maps. And within a generation, people forgot that there was ever a different system. And not everything that you build is going to be uh, non-optional, right? But it doesn't actually take much, right? In enterprise software, the person who uses your software is not the person who gets to reject the software, not the person who buys it. And so in small ways, what you ignore 
can disappear, right? You can just make it as if it was never there in the first place. And we can't, I think, as an industry, afford to sort of ignore this. The last thing is that what makes software hard, right, is that the environment is constantly changing. Um, there's a sort of ongoing pattern where someone will say, well, you know, bridges don't fall down, and software does fall down, so why can't we, you know, build software out of bridges? And the answer is we're solving a much more complicated problem, right? The foundations of the bridge do not shift by 10 meters on a daily basis. People do not come to us and ask to insert a car wash when the bridge is half complete. And people do do this with software because that's okay, because software is a fundamentally more malleable medium. But what this means is that these analogies that we draw, these sort of you know, naive leading questions that we ask about why software engineering and civil engineering can't be more similar are wrong-minded, right? They're, they're sort of pointless. And so the fundamental challenge with software is the question of how do we deal with change? And so again, our environment consists of three things, right? There's the entire world. And then in closer proximity, there are the users and the problems they're trying to solve. And in even closer proximity, there are the other pieces of software that we've written that interact with a given abstraction. Because, of course, any two abstractions are part of each other's environment. Changes to one can break the assumptions of the other. And so we can't really control the physical world. And we rarely can control our users. And so the only real degree of control that we have is how do we make one piece of software we've written not break another when we change something in our code base. And so for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to you know, try to cover uh, systems of abstractions. right? How do we build these things so that they play nicely with each other? And there are really only two ways that we can do this. right? There's a principled approach wherein we uh, try to make everything very predictably structured, right? so that if we make a change, we know exactly what it will and will not affect. There's also an adaptable solution, which is not attempting to create an overall structure, but just trying to have everything be very sparsely connected, such that if we make a change, we don't have to reason about the entire system. We can reason locally, right? Changes don't propagate very far. And these two approaches are sort of mirrored in a really excellent book called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, which is by a man named Christopher Alexander, who uh, also wrote a book called A Pattern Language, which is about uh, sort of patterns for designing homes, which was adapted by the design pattern uh, people who wrote the book, who uh, actually kind of completely misunderstand the point. But uh, the uh, two sort of cultures that he talks about when it comes to building homes and other buildings are self-conscious and unself-conscious cultures. Self-conscious cultures have a role called architect, who is a person who is expert in the design and construction of buildings. Unselfish, unself-conscious cultures uh, have uh, just a sort of do-it-yourself kind of attitude, right? Everyone builds their own home, and there are not many other structures that they, can, that they create. So self-conscious cultures are able to create skyscrapers, right? They are able to use their expertise in the design of buildings, in the uh, use of materials, to create something which is enormous. Uh, Unself-conscious cultures tend to create things like the igloo, which is something which is often constructed on a daily basis. And the interesting thing about the igloo is that it is very able to be customized sort of uh, continuously in response to the needs of the inhabitants. If it gets too warm, you just poke a hole in it. If it gets sort of you know, too cold, you fill the hole back in. And the reason that you're able to do this, the reason that you're able to, pu to punch a hole in the side of it is because it is a redundant structure. It is stronger than it absolutely has to be. So you can make a change to it without worrying that it's going to sort of crumble down around your head. Uh, conversely, skyscrapers are a little bit less, uh, you know, customizable after the fact. In San Francisco, there's a building that was uh, constructed a couple years ago, and it's begun to sink. It is now six inches beneath the sidewalk. And what we're not able to do at this point is start to pull out I-beams and make it lighter. Right? The only thing we can do is try to build around it, to wrap it in other abstractions. And barring that, they're going to have to tear it down. So principled systems are hierarchies. Right? They have this sort of uh, centralizing design principle at the root. And these principles are sort of delegated out to different parts. And so this creates a very strong interdependence between everything. If we go and pull one of these cards out, the entire structure might come tumbling down, right? So we're able to make changes 
not very many, right? We can't go and change the overall organizing principle of the structure. We have to just tear it down and build it anew. Adaptable systems, though, are more graph-like, right? They don't have some sort of central organizing principle. We are able to make sort of local changes to them. But this also means that there is no root, right? We are not able to go and take in the entire system as a whole. We have to sort of just walk it from one side to the other to really kind of keep the entire thing in our head. And having uh, sort of defined these terms, um, I want to sort of address some words that are thrown around a lot in the closure community. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Who here has seen Rich Hickey's Simple Made Easy talk? Great. So, we all know this, right? Simple and complex in the archaic English senses of the word. Uh, talk about pieces of string, right? String which is not intertwined is simple. String which is intertwined is complex, right? And when we apply this to software, it means that if we had two pieces of string that are side by side, we can pull on one without affecting the other, and if they're tied together, we can't. And so this, you know, so far makes sense, but we have to acknowledge that if this is simple, this is simple, right? We haven't done anything other than just increase the cardinality. We can increase this cardinality to enormous proportions without decreasing the simplicity, because what makes it simple is the ability for us to go and independently change different pieces of it. And if we are, in fact, able to do this, this is simple. And in fact, is the inevitable outcome of this simplicity, right? Because we have created no constraints. We have created no coupling between these different pieces. And so this can be a problem, right? Because we are able to go and change anything without sort of having uh, sort of far-reaching effects means that we can have eight different solutions for logging or for loading a configuration file in eight different parts of our code base. And this is not really desirable, right? We want to have variation in our code where that variation helps us solve a particular problem, not where it you know, sort of tickles the aesthetic sensibility of one programmer versus another, because this sort of balkanization of the code base means it's very hard for people to collaborate. It's very hard for people to build atop what someone else has created. And this is not unique to Clojure. Uh, I think that this is sort of a property which has really affected every Lisp community. And this is in part because of the language itself, right? It encourages us to create these syntactic customizations that sort of map very cleanly, very directly onto the needs of our particular problem. I think it's also because of the sort of people that join, right? We are people who want to create something that really uh, sort of satisfies our own sense of how the problem should be solved. But this creates this sort of very broad but shallow pool of stuff that we can use, right? Because if 10 people have solved the same problem in a way that really you know, satisfies their own aesthetic sensibility, an 11th person is going to come along, find all of them to be crap, and build their own. And uh, I want to be clear, I am as guilty of this as anyone else in the closure community. I'm not trying to say that this is not something that uh, exists and probably will continue to exist despite me having pointed it out, but I do think that if we want closure to succeed, we should probably acknowledge this and see what we can do to kind of at least counterbalance it, right? What sort of structures, what sort of conversations we can set in motion to allow us to build upwards rather than out. So again, principal code is a skyscraper, right? It is principled. We can kind of take in its uh, overall sort of dimensions at a glance, but it is fragile because it makes assumptions, and those assumptions are baked into every part of it. And so if the world changes around it too much, we have to throw it away. Adaptable code is sort of the converse, right? It is flexible. We can make changes to it. But there is no way that we can take in this sort of simplified, synoptic kind of view of it. We have to just hold the entire thing in our head. And there's no real way for us to combine this, right? Because if we weaken the fact that there is an overall structure to the predictable, to the principled code, then it's no longer something that we can sort of understand at a high level. And if we couple the adaptable system too tightly, changes propagate too far, right? We can no longer reason locally. And so there's no way for us to like average them together and get the benefits of both, but I think that we can layer them, right? Place one within the other. And so there are two ways we can try to go about this, right? We can put adaptable components inside a larger principled framework. And a good example of this is the mitochondrion, 
The mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell, right? It performs cellular respiration, it produces ATP, which is what we use for pretty much everything that we do. The mitochondrion, it's believed, a few billion years back was an independent organism until it was absorbed by the eukaryotic cell and sort of turned into a very important part of the overall system. And of course, the eukaryotic cell has not changed very much over the years. It is a very static environment. And so the mitochondrion responded to this by producing far more energy than it actually needs and becoming incapable of existing outside of this cell environment, right? Having these decrees of freedom, having the ability to change has no value in an environment which, do, which does not change. The converse, though, is more interesting. Uh, these are two butterflies, the viceroy and mon monarch butterfly. Uh, the monarch butterfly is inedible, so predators avoid it. The viceroy butterfly resembles the monarch. Right? So we can say that the viceroy butterfly is making a fairly uh, dangerous assumption, right? which is that it's nearby a bunch of monarch butterflies. If the monarch butterflies were ever to disappear, it would not change its appearance to resemble some other inedible butterfly, right? It would die out. But in that sort of vacuum, right, something else would fill it, something else which is better suited to these changed circumstances, right? In an ecosystem, it is not the organisms which adapt. It is the system which adapts. And so the viceroy butterfly is a very principled organism, makes very brittle assumptions, but that's okay because the disappearance of this one piece does not destabilize the whole system, right? It is able to sort of weather these changes. And so these are broadly referred to as complex adaptive systems, which is sort of an interdisciplinary field, which has a very, very broad definition. And I think there are some people in that field that would sort of uh, quibble with the way that I've just explained it. But these sorts of systems, right, where you have sort of an adaptable whole and principled subcomponents exist at every level of the world. This is empirically a very successful strategy. And it's not super hard, I think, to kind of understand why intuitively. If we have a sort of uh, an adaptable abstraction that contains these little principled pieces, we can see that change comes from the outside, right? And as change comes in from the outside, these principled, fragile pieces are protected, right? In response to small changes, we can make changes where it's easy in the adaptable sort of glue. Likewise, they're shielded from each other. And if a change is ever too great, we can go and just pluck one of them out and replace it with something else without any of the others knowing the difference. And of course, if we make them too small, then we have to write too much of this sort of adaptable glue. And remember that the adaptable code is something that we have to hold in our head. There is no other way for us to kind of reason about it. And so having too much of it places a really sort of huge burden on us. Conversely, though, if we make it too large, then replacement becomes extremely costly. Right? And so there has to be a balance here. And of course, there's not some sort of mathematical formula that will tell you here's exactly how many lines of code should be in one of your components. But there is, I think, a pretty good heuristic, which is that if two abstractions share the same assumption, if they will fail in response to the same sort of change, they belong together, right? Because they're going to have to rip both of them out anyways. Might as well put them together in one piece. Likewise, though, if two things have very different assumptions, we shouldn't put them together because that would require us to do something like splitting a skyscraper in half and sort of glomming something else onto it, right? This is a, a dangerous thing. It would require us to probably throw out useful code just because some other code has sort of, you know, uh, made an unrealistic expectation. So principled components are useful, right? They often require less code because their models can make greater assumptions. They can be faster because they can constrain their environment such that we only use sort of efficient methods for something. And they can be understood incrementally, right? We can start at the root and we can sort of peel away the layers one by one. So we should use these principal components wherever it's possible, right? We should create brittle but smaller code as long as we can sort of wrap it in this adaptable whole. And where necessary, we should use this adaptable sort of approach. And so, this is definitely a thing that we should do, but we should recognize that our tendency is to do it too often, right? We too easily believe that we not only understand how the world works, but that the world is definitely not going to change, right? We too readily project our own optimism onto something which we only understand the surface of and believe we understand its internals. And so for this reason, right, closures counter bias towards having something which is simple, right? Something which is adaptable, is useful, right? It saves us from our own hubris. But the point I want to make here is that simplicity is not an absolute good, right? 
Closure's bias towards creating these pieces that can adapt and diversify and diverge in all these sort of wacky ways is not going to lead us to some sort of overall system that allows us to have a team of a dozen engineers cooperate on it, right? It is going to create these small, balkanized pieces of code that only that one guy over there seems to enjoy working with. And so I think that this is, again, something that we need to recognize, and I think something which uh, is an impediment to closure being used on sort of a larger scale. And so if this was interesting to you, um, I really encourage you to read my book. Um, I think that it's much more uh, clearly articulated there than it has been on this stage. But um, if you do read it, right, I really encourage you to talk to me about it, right? This has been something that I've been kind of tinkering with on my own, and I don't claim that all the things that I've said here are absolutely true. This is my best understanding given what I've read. And I really would value other people's perspective, even if that perspective is to say that, you know, I'm full of it. That would be a helpful piece of feedback, frankly. So uh, again, thank you for sitting down and listening to me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, lovely talk as always. One slight uh, counterpoint maybe to the, uh, the longitude thing. It wasn't a prize for a clock, rather, a prize to solve the longitude problem. And what I found quite interesting is they were biased towards an astronomical solution, which is why it took so long for Harrison to get the money. And I wonder, another, so, there are so many different resonances in the talk, actually, as always, amazing. Um, but the other thing is the, the Kuhn thing. Um, there's a, I think it was a Max Planck quote that science proceeds one death at a time or something. And that there was a paper about a couple of years ago that actually analyzed that, whether we do wait for big name scientists to, to die in order to progress. Yeah, so I, I did actually simplify the clock thing a little bit. It was actually any solution that would allow them to find the longitude, which was seen as a possibly uh, impossible task, right? And it turns out that a lot of people found uh, multiple solutions, the uh, sextant being another one of them that was sort of there at the same time. It turns out that multiple people actually were awarded the prize. Um, but yeah, it, it's a much more complicated story, um, and that just kind of, you know, is, is slightly more complicated to explain than I wanted to, and it really screws with my uh, ongoing clock metaphor, so, you know. Anyone else? Thank you, very thought-provoking. And I'm looking forward to the, to the book. Uh, one thing I'm, I've been thinking about and, and now got my attention was this, for example, in the Maxwell's equation, and whatever the, uh, the prediction is in the physical world or physical theories, that's possible in, in software. It's, it's rarely, at least nowadays, so that, that we can predict whether our, our system works correctly. Um, Thinking about this, this, for example, the complex adaptive systems viewpoint, uh, what do you think, think is this, would, would the point be with, with software that uh, we should try to, try to build it right? Uh, or, or would it be somehow possible uh, later on that we have built it to prove that it is right? So which, which are ones of these? views would be more suitable for software construction? So I, I don't know that I, I, I mean, let me repeat back to you and you can tell me if I, I've understood this. You're, you're saying that, uh, do, do we want to be able to construct something such that it is sort of correct uh, by construction? And I didn't quite catch what the other one, what the other option was. So, so can, can we later, later on prove, prove actually, uh, like, like in at least somewhat in the physical world that they are able to prove that I something see. is correct. Um, so, so I want to draw a very hard line here between saying that abstraction is useful and saying that an abstraction is correct. And I actually think that correctness is the wrong word to use. We should say that an abstraction is self-consistent. Correctness implies some sort of universality, and really all we're saying is that if we treat this abstraction as a bubble, if we ignore everything else, then yeah, it does what we think it should do, right? And that's when we say that something is correct by construction, we mean that it is self-consistent. 
what we cannot prove, right, is that something is appropriate for a given context because the context is too complex for us to construct a proof around. And so the reason that I disagree that these sort of methods and goals of physics are appropriate for us to bring into software is because our goal is not to create a model of ever-increasing fidelity, it's to constantly find the simplest thing that satisfies us. And so the physics metaphor bothers me for the same reason that the civil engineering metaphor bothers me, because the goals and the constraints are completely different. And this is not to say that making something self-consistent is easy or bad. Obviously, that is like a necessary but not sufficient quality that we want of our software. And I'm not saying that all of the uh, proof by construction or sort of type systems and other sorts of things we've come up to sort of, you know, imply these constraints don't have value. I just don't think that they're uh, really even the hardest part of the problem. And I think that we spend a lot of time talking about them because they feel like something that we actually have any degree of leverage over, right? We control the system. We don't control the outside world. But, you know, consider how much code we've written that has actually lasted very long, right? There are kind of two classes of this. There is code that does math stuff. And so we have like some Fortran routines from the 60s that we still kind of, you know, use because they work pretty well. We also have these crusty old mainframes that run COBOL that people have just sort of accreted so many layers around, both in terms of software and in terms of institutional practices, that it's as if the world hasn't changed, right? But the first is really limited to the case of mathematics, which again, doesn't change very quickly. And the other is not, I think, a, an example that we want to follow. And so I think that what we should be looking for is, again, how do we go and cope with change, which is the only constant here, right? How do we continually redecide what is the minimal set of stuff we can afford to pay attention to? And if we are trying to be truly minimal, then we're going to be invalidated very, very quickly, right? Because like, we're, we're trying to focus very much on this sort of narrow set of things. And so that, to me, is what makes software hard. And I think that we don't talk about it very much, right? Because again, we can't write papers about it that, in, that like, include math equations, right? Math is not a tool for making these sorts of judgments. More questions? He's running. Yes. All right. Uh, here's a microphone that works. OK, that was a fantastic talk. Um, in the middle of the talk, you talked about that we need to understand the model uh, in order to understand. Uh, uh, let me see if I can get it right. I believe uh, it was we need to understand the model to understand it, its assumptions and to judge whether it's useful. Right, exactly. And. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this, this in my ear sounds like a little bit like a leaky abstraction that we talk about sometimes that, you know, you haven't provided the right kind of interface, the right kind of abstraction if you need to do that. And so that's a little bit of a pushback from me and maybe you can, uh, maybe I would misunderstand you, but uh, can you say something? I, about I mean, that? I think that all abstractions leak in that they don't make assumptions which are guaranteed to be true always, right? Now, the degree to which we understand this, I'm not saying we have to go and read every line of code of every like, you know, library we use. I'm just saying we have to know broadly what sort of assumptions are, is it making, and are we likely to run across the boundary of valid use versus sort of slightly questionable use, right? right. And so there are many cases where like, we're using something and we say, oh, well, we need to you know, uh, answer 10 requests per second. And then you know, the question of whether or not something is sort of fast is not really uh, a particularly interesting question, right? Uh, but the sort of idea that a uh, abstraction which is not leaky is something which we can use blindly um, is something which kind of... So, like, something that I didn't sort of go into for time was, you know, if we have something and we don't know how it works, the only way we can be sure that if it worked yesterday, it'll work today, is for us to maintain the exact set of circumstances that worked, right? We have to kind of perform voodoo. We have to, you know, drink two sips of water and click our heels together before we go and hit deploy, because otherwise, who knows what might happen? And the only way that we can have confidence 
right? The only way that we can deploy something into sort of an unknown circumstance is if we understand at least to some degree how it works on the inside. And so, I mean, maybe that makes the abstraction leaky. Maybe leakiness is some sort of uh, more unreasonable sort of assumption as opposed to a reasonable assumption. But I think that, you know, what we can't say is the only good abstraction is one which we get to use blindly. Because I think that that, that just isn't really true. Right. So I, I agree with almost everything that you said. But I'll, I'll provide one example that I like of an abstraction. And that's regular <laughs> expressions, which I think is a very non-leaky abstraction. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that. And, no, I, and so I think that that's valid. I mean, I think that, you know, it's there. But I mean, you know, let me just say, uh, backtracking <laughs> has some very real consequences in terms of the performance of something. Okay, I'm, so backtracking is not a valid implementation of regular expressions in my book. Okay, well, then you can tell all the Perl people to suck it. But, like, the, the fact is that, like, yes, I understand. If we go in and confine it to what finite automata allow us to do, then it is a, a very nice mathematical construction. I think there's very little that I can say that will disagree with that. But uh, I think that it's provable that, like, because people have added all these things that do not conform to that very narrow definition, means that that by itself is only useful for a subset of things, right? And so it doesn't allow us to accomplish as much. And so, uh, yes, there are definitely counter examples of what I'm saying, I do not think that you could find a real world application, which is in itself a complete counter example. Okay, any more? Yeah, there's one. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, that's, I guess, a lot of things to think about. And um, uh, there is this idea that uh, a computer system could be um, designed uh, as, uh, as a like, human being, for example, or as an organism uh, where you have like, um, different parts which are interchangeable. And uh, if we talk about like, um, biological organisms, there are like cells and organs, and there are kind of uh, cells are interchangeable and they die. And if we uh, think about a system uh, as, uh, as a complicated uh, collection of those uh, interchangeable parts, uh, so what do you think about, uh, like, um, could it be probably a solution to, uh, to the problem that we don't really understand, like, what parts should be adaptable and what parts should be, like, more um, uh, principled. Was, uh, yeah, right. So uh, if we have like a couple of interfaces uh, that are actually um, like solid in and kind of fixed in place, and everything else is just uh, changing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, so what was the question? Uh, so um, you mentioned that uh, there is like no, um, there is, uh, this is hard to figure out like, um, where to draw the line between mm -hmm. uh, both approaches. So maybe, uh, and uh, I've seen that this approach is becoming more and more popular in software community. Mm -hmm. uh, then maybe it's just, it's the way to, um, to, uh, to design our systems. So, so uh, do you think this might be useful to uh, kind, of uh, kind of design our systems after those things. I, I think so. I mean, you know, it's not like we can, you know, say, you know, here's how the liver works and here's how it interacts with the kidney. Let's go and design our microservices to mimic that, and you know, exactly, right? I mean, it's it's going to be by metaphor and probably a pretty loose one at that. But you know, microservices are an example, I think, of exactly this sort of system, right? Where you have these individual pieces that are very sort of principled and do one thing well and have this sort of much more flexible kind of uh, communication topology that connects them, right? Uh, as for where you draw uh, the lines between them, I mean, the sort of very rough guideline I gave is, you know, make things principled where possible. And, you know, your judgment of that is, you know, as good as mine, I think. Uh, this is not a complete formula for building good systems, unfortunately. I, I don't have that uh, and, and probably won't. But um, I do think that, like I said, there's some interesting stuff going on in microservices. There are a lot of people who are thinking pretty hard about that. I think that the overall approach uh, maps pretty well into what I described here. And so they may be coming up with some interesting sort of heuristics there. I don't know. 
More questions? Doesn't seem like that. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Zach Tillman. Thank you.